Marshall. He loves airplanes. We have to identify every one that flies overhead. So, we'll, thank you. Thank you. Are y'all doing well? Yeah. It's so good to see you. Y'all look wonderful. Um, You're out of breath. <laughs> You're all out of breath. <laughs> Sandy and Miss Judy Carroll back there, and Diane, Sandy's sister. Wow. And they did all of this. That's amazing. They're not finished yet. They still have some other stuff they want to do, but it, it looks great. It's wonderful. So um, we're getting ready for Bible school. Next, y'all realize this now, next Wednesday, Bible school begins right here. And that's right. Um, so 6 to 8.15. And we'll be here at 5. If you're helping at all, make sure you, if you can be here by 5, that would be great. And we'll start to register. We will have five, I think five tables out front. And there will be a poster on the front of each table uh, verifying the age that that person is, that group is registering. And the teacher's name's there. So some of you have volunteered to be runners out there or safety folks. So if y'all come next Wednesday, whether you're helping or coming for Bible study, there will be an adult Bible study class. It will start at 6.30. My hope for y'all is that you'll just show up early and help us with what we need to do. If you're not already helping in an official capacity, then um, you'll help. And then we have worship rally together right here at 6 o'clock. And when that's over... We all go to different places, and that would give you opportunity to go to your adult Bible study class, which will be back here. I think um, we're Dave, and, and uh, maybe, I don't know if you want to meet in that class or across the hall, but the bigger class. But anyway, that hallway, uh, Dave and Jacob are teaching the first two nights back there. So next Wednesday be different. So y'all have a class from 6.30 to 8.00. Bring refreshments. Your teacher isn't supposed to bring refreshments. Y'all bring refreshments. You don't have to bring refreshments. If you show up without refreshments, they'll still let you in the door. <laughs> but bring refreshments back there. You can have your own refreshments. Dave and Jacob are preparing the lesson. It'll be the same text that all the other classes are, are dealing with as well. We're in, uh, in Genesis the first night. We go to Daniel the second night. And um, the third night. What we do the third night, Dave? Um, anyway, and then there's four and five. We're only doing three nights, but four and five, we'll, we'll cover that Sunday morning. So um, after Bible school, and that will be our commencement. So a lot of cool things going on. But uh, what I was talking about in the parking lot, when you come next Wednesday, if you can be here by five, that'd be wonderful. There'd be tables set up out there. In front of this building will be a safe zone, no cars, no parking, no drive through So we'll have that roped off or cones or whatever. I need as many of you as possible to help tell cars to come down and go around the back. And if you're dropping off a child, they still have to come in and register or come to the front and register that child. So there's going to be a lot of parking going on. Just make sure nobody pulls through in any way, shape, or form because that's where the children are going to register with their guardian or parent. Do they have to register every day or just the first day? Just the first day, unless, of course, unless we have somebody the second day that wasn't here. Just the first day. Uh, Sandy has folders for each table, each class. Um, the name tags have uh, something uh, that, uh, the motif that goes with this. I think they're starfish. It's different than our meeting the other night. It all has to do with Breaker Rock Beach. So there's a starfish, there's a seahorse, and it is on their name tag. It's on the table. The teachers have the same thing. So you can easily see this child is a starfish. That's their teacher. They have a starfish. And the rooms back there will have a starfish, okay, if that's the room. So we try to make it as easy as possible to get them in the right place. But we just need help registering out front, and then they can hang out in this room until we start at 6 o'clock. I don't want them hanging out in front long next to that busy road. So are teachers signing them in, or are yes. teachers seeing them? Out there. Teachers sign them in, register, and our runners and our helpers can be in here getting to know them, just tell them where the restrooms are or whatever. This will be a little hangout spot until we start. Teachers will be at the tables 
registering everybody. That way their parent or guardian can see who their child is going to spend time with and they can meet the parent or guardian. Well, they should be in their group in this room. They will be when we start at 6 o'clock. Um, registration will stop at that point with the teachers. And some of those that are helping will stay out there in case we have some stragglers, and we will. But we have to start at 6 o'clock on the dock. So teachers will move from out there. They'll round up their little ones, come in here and say, anybody in my group, come with me. We'll line up in the back, and we'll come in together at 6 o'clock on the dock. So keep that in mind. You will have some mass announcements coming your way um, between now and then just to remind you. But if you forget and wander in here next Wednesday night, you're going to be surprised because it's going to be very different. So just keep that in mind. We will put you to work. <laughs> That's right. If you show up, we'll put you to work. Um, so anyway, be praying about that. Please cover that with prayer. Uh, we've talked to several families, uh, children, grandchildren, neighbors. Um, I believe we're going to have a, a really good time and a fruitful time. I'm praying that it will be a fruitful time for the kingdom and, and for Homewood Baptist Church, too, uh, with families and young people. And I don't think it's just coincidental that, like, uh, Peggy brought the, the lady Sunday with her children and the other two children from Bucksport uh, came with her. Miss Jennifer has three teenage daughters. She started coming a few weeks ago. She's actually helping us with some Bible school. Her daughters, I believe, uh, are willing to take part in the skit. So we have several young people that are coming now, not to mention the ones that Sonia is teaching back there right now that are coming and their friends and, and acquaintances. So we already have some that are coming that are taking part. And so pray about that. Pray about our response to what God does and, and the families that he brings. Safety for all those involved and that the word will be conveyed very clearly. Our theme this year is that God's truth never changes. Uh, it's the rock that we stand on in a world of shifting sand. God's word is the rock. And that's why it's called Breaker Rock Beach. And we'll talk about the word of God being that stronghold, that foundation that we need so desperately. Y'all do know that, don't you? That um, So many folks have just said uh, the, the Word of God is, is a good thing, but it's we're going to add to it. <laughs> and it, it's just uh, been a crazy, crazy time to, to uh, be around, I guess. But I pray for our children, our grandchildren, great-grands, as they have to learn and uh, grow up in a culture that's very shifting. All right. I want to pray with you. We, we started in Ephesians last week. It just gave you a little introduction. We had a video. We had a body life meeting, a lot going on last week. Tonight we're going to start digging into Ephesians, and there's a lot here. So pray for me, and, and let's learn together and grow together. Thank you for praying for my sister. Um, she had a procedure finally. They put her off several times. She's doing better. She's at home. Um, she did not have a bleeding ulcer. They sent off uh, something they found in her stomach. Um, she had the, she does have the E. coli, and they're treating her for that. The doctor said she'd had it for, for a while, several weeks. That's why they put the surgery off to get her some antibiotics and, and just to see what the damage was. But um, pray for them. Her husband, uh, Tommy, has had some of the same symptoms. So they're testing their water source and their well and their well trying to find out where they got the E. coli, so, or where she got it, and they suspect that he has it as well. So pray for them. Also, Miss Grace Granger has COVID, so she called in. Please add Miss Grace to your prayer list. And also, um, Jack Johns said that uh, Miss Patricia said that we could place her on the prayer list, and we are doing so promptly. Um, Patricia is going through some difficulties physically and dealing with some things that are uh, very serious. And so pray for Patricia and Jack and that. And um, so I'll just uh, let you know we need to add her to our prayer list and lift them up in prayer. Also remember Terry Lilly. He's our chairman of Deacons and he was spent some time in the hospital over the weekend. He's doing better. Uh, so continue to pray for Terry. Um, Sean Dinkelacker, this is Jerry and Elise's son, 
I believe is shipping off to Guam. Um, Sean, who is in the Marines, to the prayer list, add him to the prayer list as he is leaving for Guam tomorrow for six months. Um, so that was today. She sent me that today. So pray for Sean. Uh, add him to the list. And by the way, uh, Jerry and Elise, who are so faithful to be here, are not here tonight because they are beginning their training in grief share. It, it's a, a ministry about dealing with grief in our lives. And they're going through uh, a, a training for several weeks at another church. Uh, they have to go through a, a bit of a rigorous uh, routine to learn the things that they're teaching. Uh, we're, we're ordering material here. And when they come through that, they will be able to teach and lead this, this group about grief. Uh, and it covers a, a large gamut of uh, things that people will go through how to cope with life after the fact or while you're going through it. So I appreciate their willingness to do that. It adds another element of ministry to Homewood Baptist Church, and they can tell you more about it as they complete their course, but it will be something we can open up to the community as well to offer some counseling and grief and walking through some tough times. So pray for Jerry and Elise as they are in training right now. And I think they're, they're at the beach um, learning down there. I think it's at Forest Brook Baptist, but uh, pray for them in that endeavor. Are there other prayer concerns tonight? Barbara Bryant is asking for prayer for Parker for her eye surgery on in August. All right. Thank you, Barbara. Parker Hardwick has a, I guess it's a sty, what's considered a sty, and they're surgically removing it in August. And Parker's a young lady. She's just 14, I think. She's 14, something like that. I don't remember. They grew up so fast, but uh, that's Miss Barbara's uh, granddaughter, one of her granddaughters. So pray for Parker. Anybody else? Nate? Uh, it's not so much for a person, but it is for a place uh, where my sister stayed in the home that she's staying in. There's been a big outbreak of uh, COVID, mm -hmm. and uh, we could pray overall, you know, for some. Uh, for God to be lenient on him, I guess. That's right. But uh, it, it's really getting bad. My sister hasn't got it yet. But. Okay. Thank you, Nate. And that's a concern that we've seen several times, in, especially in whether it's assisted living or skilled nursing or, or uh, a, a, a housing of multiple people. When one person has it or one person comes in to visit that has it, it spreads like wildfire. And so, yeah, that's... Thank you, Nate. You pray. And um, pray for those uh, like Miss Lois Marissi, um, who's down there in Garden City, and also Annie uh, Richardson, who is down in Georgetown now. Sandy put that in their bulletin. I think it was this past Sunday um, about Annie. Maybe it was the Sunday before. So keep them in your, your prayers. What else? Other Laura called just before I left. Okay. And she's still having problems with her lungs and uh, her eye. She's got has to have cataract surgery in August. She has astigmatism in the other eye. Okay. She may have to have a stent put in her throat someplace. I'm not sure okay. where. All right. We we'll certainly continue to pray for Laura, but it's a good thing that she is having her eye surgery. And at first, they said that wasn't an option, so she got a second opinion. Went across the street to another doctor, and, and he said it was an option, apparently, so they're scheduling that. But they're telling her, I think that's what she said, that with the astigmatism, she may still not be able to drive. Right. Okay. All right. Any others? I got about three things or four things I'd like to mention in the Bible school. That's the time and uh, the cause to be engaged. Not the British from my
for our country, other countries. Um, and I don't know if you watch the Olympics, if you watch the opening ceremonies and so forth, but it's always amazed me that no matter what's going on at home, sometimes when you have those those Olympics coming together and the ceremonies, you will have you will have Israel and Palestine and Jordan and you have those teams right there competing, but being amicable, they're, they're being civil to one another, even though they're on different boats. As in this case, they came in on boats. But um, we can find a way to be civil when it's expected of us. But, but there's a lot of things going on back in their home town and with their families that is heartbreaking. So, but anyway, uh, just keep folks in prayer. Lift them up, other countries, as well as our own. Um, thank you, James. Any others? Barbara, since she is the leader of the praise and worship team, wants to remind that we have refreshments on Sunday. <laughs> Barbara is on vacation. And she, yeah. And she's giving us direction from the beach. <laughs> I don't think that's allowed, Barbara. <laughs> But thank you for the reminder. Sunday is the first Sunday of August. Can you believe that? So we will have our refreshment time, and and praise team is responsible for that. So remember, between Sunday school and worship, we'll get out five minutes early from Sunday school. We'll delay worship time five minutes to give us time to fellowship. People say, why do you do that? Because we enjoy being with each other, and it gives us the time, too, to get to know some other people maybe that we haven't talked to. And uh, it's just a good time. We need to fellowship together, not just to, to sit and hear, but to, to interact with one another. But thank you, Barbara, for the reminder. And you hope that everybody winds down before they come in here for the service. That's right. You know, wind down before you come in here. Um, and I hope you have a good time, Barbara. Think about us while you're down there. Um, all right. Any others? Unspoken. Any other unspoken requests? Something on your heart? You just don't feel comfortable verbalizing. Okay. All right. All right. Let me pray with you, and then we're going to step into some deep water. Okay. Father, thank you for your kindness to us. I thank you for your word and your spirit. I thank you for loving us the way you do, for extending grace to us. And, um, and as a result, we enjoy peace, inner peace, because of your grace. Lord, help us to, to get a grasp of that, even tonight as we talk about this. I pray that you be with those that we mentioned and added to the prayer list, those that have been on our prayer list for a while, those that have received uh, an answer of healing and restoration, uh, those that are still facing uh, treatments and surgeries and life-altering days ahead. Father, I pray that you would teach us all to trust you, to depend on you, and to place our faith in you no matter what. Thank you for Homewood Baptist Church, and thank you for these folks that are here tonight, and I pray that you would work in, in our lives that next week as we begin Bible school, that we would be looking for opportunities to share the gospel, seeing people's needs, reaching out to folks, praying for them, that lives would be transformed, that we would see newness uh, of life, that we would see a, a new inner energy and motivation to serve, that your, life, that your love and kindness would be poured out through us to those that are here, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. I am not a Hollywood advocate, even though uh, I quote from a lot of stuff every, every once in a while. But uh, there was a movie that came out many, many years ago, and the, I think the lead person in it was Patrick Swayze. For some reason, that's one of my wife's favorite actors. <laughs> it was. Um, but there was a scene in one of those movies, or the movie that I'm speaking of, where he was a bouncer in a bar, and he was teaching people how to be a bouncer, or, yeah, he was the cooler, to be a bouncer. And you say, what does that have to do with the scripture? It has a lot to do with it because, and our Bible school, because you would think he was teaching them the method of self-defense, which he was, 
teaching them some hand-to-hand -hand combat, which he did a little bit of that, but something that he kept saying over and over and over again was, be nice. Be nice. Walk them to the door as much as they allow you to. Be nice. If you need to walk them to the door, walk them to the door. But be nice. Bible school is a time when we get to share the kindness and the love and compassion of God to some folks who don't get that anywhere else. Uh, and I say that tonight because a lot of times Bible school, particularly the first night, can be so chaotic and stressful. And if we're not careful, we'll forget the main reason we're here and we're just looking at our schedule and the clock and our agenda and thinking, i got to get this done and we've got to get here. And if we're not careful, we'll be yelling at people and making people upset. Kindness goes a long, long way, which means you and I better be prayed up, okay? Be prayed up. Be, be nice. Be nice. That's one thing that the church, I think, is losing. We are into a lot of things these days, but being nice isn't one of them. For a lot of folks, niceness is a sign of weakness, but not for our Lord and not for His Word. He was compassionate. We have those times when he turned over the tables and the money changers' tables in the temple and the times that he was very straightforward about the Pharisees and the things that he told them and called them. But Jesus was kind, compassionate, and that's how he expects his church to be. Tonight as we enter into Ephesians, you're going to see the establishment of the church. Um, you're going to see... Paul's acknowledgement that his ministry was not something he came up with on his own. God called him. God equipped him. God sent him. He commissioned him. And then you and I must ask the question, what about me? Has God called me? Has he sent me? Has he commissioned me and commanded me to do something, to go somewhere? That question needs to be asked tonight, posed, and and pray for me. We're going to talk about election, predestination. We're going to talk about uh, choice and God's calling. And there's so much here, so we're going to be here till tomorrow morning. I hope that's <laughs> um, and I want to read this to you out of a book that is, that is part of our study. I won't read a whole lot from it. Our, the Bible is our main text, obviously, but I wanted you to know this, that I I will be following this outline more so than the one I handed you last week, although there's plenty from that that I'll draw from as well. Starting with chapter 1 of Ephesians, we're going to answer the question, why worship? Why worship God? Okay? What should we pray for? What should we pray for? You ever wonder that? What is so amazing about grace? Some people think, well, I didn't ask him to do that for me. I've heard people say that. Can you believe that? What is so amazing about grace? Who are we? Probably the most important question you'll ever ask. And you have to answer that question before you ever think about asking about Jesus. Who am I? Who are we? Why is the church a big deal? So is it a big deal? What should we pray for? Um, I covered that then. How can we be unified? How do new people live? New people live. Christ? How can we imitate God? That's a great question because he's holy and perfect and we're not. What is God's plan for marriage? What should or how should we parent? That, that's a lost principle these days it seems. How should we see our vocation? I almost said vacation, Barbara, but it says vocation. How should we see our vocation and how do we fight? You think, well that is silly. No, it's covered. How do we fight? Um, who do we fight is a great question as well. But how do we fight? I want you to go to Ephesians chapter 1. And we're going to move forward here to uh, probably verse, well, verse 14. Chapter 1, uh, verse 1 through 14. And I want you to know something that in the Greek text, verses 3 through 14 are one sentence. Okay? Verses 3 through 14. In the Greek is one sentence. It is a lengthy sentence, but it is one sentence. 
And that's not the only place in Ephesians you're going to find this. Eight times in Ephesians you're going to find about three, four, five, six, seven verses that are really one sentence. Why is that important? Because we have to read it together to get the context and the content right. So let's start at verse 1, chapter 1. Paul, listen to how he describes himself, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God to the saints who are at Ephesus. Do any of y'all not have at Ephesus? There are several translations that don't, and it's not wrong. Does anybody not have at Ephesus? In Ephesus? In Ephesus? Anybody leave that part out? Mine does not have. Okay, and let me explain that, and I'm glad. Thank you, Lucy. A lot of, and you may have a footnote, a lot of the later um, manuscripts, and I say later, I mean like the Dead Sea Scrolls, the ones that actually go back further, do not include this in this text. That's why a lot of scholars believe Ephesians was a circular letter. This went to Ephesus, certainly, but it most probably went to a lot of other churches as well. It, circled, it uh, made its rounds there in, in Asia. So if you don't have that, it's not a misprint. It's not a problem. It's not a bad translation. It's, it's, it just means that sometimes, in, as they went back to the text, um, some of the older, uh, more closer to the actual happenings manuscripts did not include that. So it's very possible that if uh, they were sending a letter around to the churches, somebody could say, this one goes to this church, this one goes to this church, and somebody notated, okay, this one goes to Ephesus, and somehow that got included in there. It's not a big deal. I just sometimes have to stop and explain because I know sometimes y'all wonder, while some words are in some translations and some are not. If you see that, let me know, and I'll try my best to explain it. But that's why some translations do not include that Ephesus, because Dead Sea Scrolls and some of the older manuscripts do not have that qualifier. It simply says, to the saints uh, and, and those who are faithful in Christ Jesus, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is the, the run-on sentence here. It starts in verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as He chose us in Him, in Christ, before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before Him. In love, He predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to Himself, according to the kind intention of his will there's that word kind intention of his will to the praise of the glory of his grace which he freely bestowed on us in the beloved in the love that the word agape there is the same word in the beloved as speaking of jesus there it's capital b remember god is love okay in him we have redemption through his blood the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace which he lavishly uh, lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight. He made known to us the mystery of his will according to his kind intention, which he purposed in him, in Jesus, with a view to an administration suitable to the fullness of the times. That is the summing up of all things in Christ, things in the heavens and things upon the earth. In him, in Jesus, also we have obtained an inheritance having been predestined according to his purpose, who works all things after the counsel of his will, to the end that we who were the first to hope in Christ should be, uh, should be to the praise of his glory. In him you also, after listening to the message of the truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed, you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise, who was given as a pledge of our inheritance or a foreshadowing, a down payment is another way of translating that in our, of our inheritance with a view to the redemption of God's own possession to the praise of his glory. That is one long sentence, isn't it? There's a lot there. Does the Bible talk about predestination? Mm -hmm. well, we just read that word several times. Okay? It talks about predestination. Okay? Does the Bible talk about election? Yeah, it's in the Bible. Paul says here at the beginning, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God. Do you remember how Paul began his ministry? He was not on his way to church. 
he was not on his way to find another tent to set up for his next revival. He was Saul of Tarsus, who was persecuting the church, and God stopped him in his tracks because God is sovereign. He didn't have to ask permission. Paul didn't go to the altar and ask for that transformation. God stopped him in his tracks and said, Saul, why are you persecuting me? So Paul says it was the will of God. He reached out. He stopped me in my tracks. He chose me. He pulled me into this ministry. He told me what he wanted me to do. God initiated this. I want you to hear what this is saying without reading anything into it, without being denominational. I just want you to hear that God is God and he initiates you and I could never come to know God if he didn't initiate that relationship, okay? There's so many passages in Scripture that talk about God pulling us to him, God reaching out by his grace, God extending this, this uh, love to humanity. It starts back in Genesis when Adam and Eve sinned and hid themselves. Remember, God came in the garden and he called out, where are you? That's grace. And that's God initiating that relationship after they sinned. You understand? Throughout Scripture, God is the initiator. So it is up to Him. He starts this. He calls. He draws according to Scripture. It's God ordained. God initiated. Uh, he starts it. So Paul says, by the will of God to the saints who are at Ephesus and who are faithful. This is a qualifier we need to see who are faithful in Christ Jesus. Grace to you, and I love this breakdown of this verse, grace to you, this is what comes from God, He offers. And grace is what? What do we say? A definition of grace is what? Unmerited, Unmerited favor. Okay? There's a great gospel song about that. Unmerited favor. So grace to you, He's talking to the church, God extended his love to, toward us, and that was grace, unmerited faith. We didn't deserve it, never can. So he extends the grace to us, and it says, and peace from God. Because of the grace, we can now have peace. Without the grace, you and I will never be at peace internally, ever. Mm -hmm. But because of God's grace, we now can take part in, in internal peace. We're not talking about world peace. We're talking about internal peace. Grace to you, peace from God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? And then he says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us, watch this, with a lot of money in the bank account. Is that, is that your translation? Okay. Maybe it was this one. He blessed us with perfect health from now on. Is that in there? No. Okay. He blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. The commentators and, and even going back to the Greek, um, this is talking about eternally and spiritually. This is not a passage to take, lift out and say, this means God wants us healthy, wealthy, and wise. That is not what this passage is about. And I want you to know there's a lot of foundation for that here. This is eternal. This is heavenly. God has blessed us with eternal blessings. Okay? Y'all looking forward to heaven? Yeah. All right. Do you know that that would be impossible if God hadn't extended his grace to us? <clears throat> and because he loved us so much and he's holy and we're not, Jesus had to be offered as a sacrifice. So because of that, back then, God has already, and there's a past tense word there, He has blessed eternally, already taken care of. He has, he has made provision. Y'all remember Y2K? Did y'all have barrels of water and food packed up and stuff and the computers were going to shut down and stuff? Y'all remember that? They said the world's going to come to an end. That was 24 years ago. We're still here. But we made provision. A lot of people made a lot of provision. We thought COVID was bad with the toilet paper. Yeah. But in Y2K, I mean, we had stockpiles of stuff. People had, they had off buildings and insulated them and put food and, and uh, 
wood stove. And, I mean, we're talking about the end of the world stuff, apocalyptic stuff. They made provisions for what they thought was, was coming. Well, God has made provisions for what he knows is coming. And that provision is in Jesus, in Christ. Okay? Back then, in time, back then, he has made provision for you and for me. And if I can read this carefully, I have so much to draw from up here, but I'll read this. This is a quote from Harold Holner, who is a commentator about this particular passage. And he says, uh, the time of election is in eternity past. And the purpose of election is that believers will be holy and blameless in his sight for eternity. What God has begun in the past will be accomplished and completed in the future. And that starts here when Paul says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in Jesus before the foundation of the world. So what the commentator is saying that election is an eternal eternity past. Okay? It's already happened, happened way back when. He chose us in Jesus before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and blameless before him. Now how can people who are sinful by nature be holy and blameless before God? I gave you this gift while it was secret while ago. How's the only way you and I can be holy? Be born again. Be born again. Jesus must move in. His blood must cover, must take care of the debt that we owe. So he made provision way back when and Jesus had to be sent so that we could have a future. He chose us in Jesus, in him, before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself. And again, ladies, that includes male and female. Through Jesus Christ to himself, according to the kind intention of his will. What does that mean? Go to John 3.16. John 3.16, if you you want to turn there, let's just go back there. Kind intention of his will. Y'all know this verse? Yes. Yeah. Probably the most familiar verse of the scripture, okay? The kind intention of his will, okay? Look at what it says. For God so loved the world, and this world here means cosmos, the universe. He loved, he loved us all. Okay. There is not a qualifier in this verse that it says he loves some. It's not there. And you're not going to find that anywhere in Scripture where God loves some. He loves all. And there's a reason I'm telling you this because of what we're talking about with election here. For God so loved the world that he gave. You see that? Love, he gave. That's what love does. It motivates us to give. It motivated God to give his only begotten son that whoever believes I look this word up to make sure whoever means everybody okay whoever is all inclusive word here it is not a limiter you don't hear me talk about Calvinism or Arminianism from the pulpit because it's not in scripture elections in scripture the sovereignty of God is in scripture but we need to bring it forward from the scripture, not from Jacob Arminius or John Calvin or, or Martin Luther or anybody else. Those are people just like us. This is the divine inspired word of God. And so I'm bringing things to you. I try my best to make sure it's coming out of God's word and not a camp somewhere where people draw a line and say, are you this? Are you that? So I want you to, to understand this. When it says in John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes, that's exactly what it means. Okay, Whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. There is no qualifier there, okay, except for belief, faith. The Bible does tell us that without faith it is impossible to please God. 
And someone said this even recently. God initiates the contact, the relationship. But we must respond. If you take that element out of this, we're going to be left undone. God initiates. He is sovereign. He is awesome. He is mighty God. But there has to be a response from us. And it's called faith. And the Bible is clear about that. You're saved by faith through grace. And, and that's nothing that we can come up with ourselves. Paul says that very clearly. It's by faith. Through grace. Because God has provided the means in which we place the faith. They're the person of Jesus Christ. Why do I say this? Because a lot of our brothers and sisters, a lot of churches and denominations will get turned sideways and they'll break up and split over Calvinism and Arminianism. And the thing that I've heard people fight about so much is that with election, God chooses some. That means he doesn't choose others. I've never found that in Scripture. What I do find is that God makes it possible through his abundant love and grace for people to believe in him and to respond. But not everybody's going to. As a matter of fact, the Bible says there will be few that enter in. Few. Most, the majority, many, will go down the road that leads to destruction is what Scripture says. So, you understand that. I have never found a place in Scripture that it says God creates anybody just to send them to hell. That he has limited his grace just to a few people. The God that I serve and that I found in Scripture is such a loving and compassionate God that He has done everything necessary for anyone who wants to believe in Him can and can have eternal life with Him. Okay, So that's why you're not going to hear me get on the bandwagon with a lot of other denominations or even our own denominations sometimes. I'm going to stick with the God that I know in the Scripture. And I don't know everything, okay? But everything that I've seen in Scripture says that we serve a God who loves everybody. And if that's true, then He has provided a way for everybody to be redeemed through Jesus. Jesus didn't just die on the cross for a few people. He died for everybody and anybody that would place their faith and trust in Him. So having said that, go back to, go back to Ephesians here where it says... In verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. He has already done that. Just as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before Him. And if you will take out that, um, I don't know if that's a prepositional phrase. I, I've been out of English class so long, I don't remember. But read it without that in, in, in the detail inside where it says just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world in him that we should be holy and blameless he chose us in Christ that we should be holy and blameless he predestined us to be holy and blameless what does that mean I've shared this with you before it's I my simple mind understands this when we were kids kids love to play in the mud do you know that Braden, well, if we're walking along holding hands and he finds a mud puddle, he will do his best to pull me over that direction. He'll step right in the middle of it because it's fun. Okay. When I was a teenager and, and getting older, I loved to go ride in a Jeep or something and ride through the mud. It's just fun to get dirty like that. Okay. When a manufacturer makes a Jeep or a four-wheel drive vehicle or something like that, they have put the components together. They have put the electronics together. They have put the right tires and the wheels and the gearing and the differential and then the transmission and they have put everything together so this vehicle will go off road. Everything about that vehicle is built to take that, to go that direction. They have extra lights, they have different gearing and the transfer box. They have, they have things that are specific to four wheel drive vehicles so that they can go off road. Does everyone that buys a four-wheel vehicle take it off road? No, because we don't want to get it dirty. <laughs> There's plenty of Jeeps on the road. There are plenty of four-wheel drive vehicles that will never see a, a mud hole because we choose not to use it that way. It's built for that. It was predestined to go that route, but not all of us will take that route. 
Every single person here was built by the manufacturer to house Jesus and the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit in our hearts. Every single person has the same manufacturer. We were built, predestined to spend eternity with God. Every person. We fell in the garden. Now we got a problem. Okay? We need a mechanic. We need some problem. I mean, a problem fix. We, we got an issue. God... When he created us, he created us to have a relationship with us. He predestined us to have a relationship with him forever. So, there was a problem. Jesus had to come. He took care of it. We have to receive that gift. He comes into our hearts. Problem solved. Okay? Through faith. Not through effort of ours. Through the work of Calvary. In Jesus and Jesus alone. Do you see that? Not everyone... It's going to go off road. Not everyone is going to go the way that they were predestined, built, equipped to go. Not everyone is going to ask Jesus to come in and fix that problem that's in their heart. The problem is there in everybody. God built us to have a relationship with Him. He expects us to. He wants us to. He has said that I love the whole world so much so that my only son is going to come and pay the price that y'all can't pay. So that you can spend eternity with me and we can restore this relationship. I can restore it and we can have this ongoing relationship. That's what he wants because he's compassionate and loving and gracious and kind. But not everybody's going to yield to that. Y'all remember when we studied uh, Hebrews? The sermon of Hebrews. It's more of a sermon than it is a letter. Throughout Hebrews, the warning was given over and over and over and over. Don't fall away. Don't give up on your faith. <coughs> Stay to the end. Run the race that you will finish. Why? Because the church was under so much persecution and it was hardship and their own families were telling them, you may as well just, just like Job, you may as well just curse God and die. Just, he don't care about you. And the church was undergoing so much stress and hardship, the writer of Hebrews, the preacher of Hebrews, was begging the church, do not give up on your faith. Don't walk away from God. Why in the world would he ever have to say that if it was not possible? Because he saw people walking away from the faith. He saw the Judases. He saw people saying it's just not worth it. It doesn't mean that they were not built, manufactured, created by their God to serve him and to follow him. It means they chose not to. And I have brothers and sisters that will, will argue of that point. I've just never found evidence in Scripture that God loves a few people, but he doesn't love everybody. I want to share some scriptures more about that in just a second. And I want to read this to you as well. There's, there's so much here. I, I told you we'd be here tomorrow morning, but I'll try to cut it back. But there's, there's so much in this passage. This comes from a commentator about this particular passage, and I want to read it to you. It says, This God who is to be praised is the one who has blessed us. This is a verbal form of the adjective praise at the beginning of the verse. The verb means to speak well of. Here it means to benefit, prosper. This word is not used in classic Greek literature. For example, well, I won't go into that detail. Um, it is talking about blessed. He has blessed us. Um, and then it says, um, it says this. Ephesians 1.3 tells much about God's blessing on believers. When? Eternity past. We talked about that. With what? Every spiritual blessing. Where? In the heavenly realms. How? In Christ. Okay? One more time. Ephesians 1.3 tells us much about God's blessings on believers. When did it happen? Eternity past. With what? Every spiritual blessing. Where? In the heavenly realms. How? In Christ Jesus. Okay? That's his blessings that he's talking about. Look at verse 7. In Him, in Christ, in Jesus, we have redemption through His blood. Not through our works, not through our family name, not through how long we've been in the church service, none of that. Look at it. In Him, we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses. Do we need forgiveness? Have we, do we, have we been that bad? It's not about sins committed. It's about sin, the nature of sin within us. The separation that comes from the, what, how we're born. His blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of His grace. It doesn't say according to the merit of the person 
or the worth of the person. It says according to the riches of His grace. Aren't you glad that God doesn't base salvation on how good we are or how much worth He thinks we, we have or carry with us? We all have good days and bad days, right? Would you want Him judging you as far as your worth of salvation or whether you were somebody that a good candidate for salvation on one of those bad days? Okay, me neither. But I want to tell you something that we don't think about a whole lot. If you think about the good days, you think, I'm not so bad today. According to the prophet of the Old Testament, even our best days is as filthy rags. Our righteousness is as filthy rags to God. It doesn't stand up in the court, in the high courts of the heavens. So it must be according to his, the riches of his grace. And it is. Verse 8 says, which he lavished upon us. Was he stingy? Is God stingy with his grace? No, he lavishes upon us, just pours out on us, just keeps on coming, okay? Lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, he made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his kind intention, which he purposed in Jesus and him, with a view to an administration suitable to the fullness of times, that is the summing up of all things in Christ. Nothing makes sense apart from Christ. But everything makes sense and comes together in Christ and through Christ. Things in the heavens and things upon the earth. In Jesus, in Him also we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to His purpose, who works all things after the counsel of His will. Look at the first part. It says we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined. Okay. How do you obtain an inheritance? Being born into a family, you're going to be part of the family to inherit something, okay? The Bible says that we are adopted into the family of God. We become those that inherit. It says God predestined us to be that way. He predestined us to be family. And we were until Adam and Eve, until the original sin. Now there's a problem, so we have to be grafted back into the vine. We, we have to be adopted as children of God. By faith, because of His grace. But He predestined us to be that way. He, his plans were us to walk together, to live together, to, to commune, to have this fellowship. You ever thought about that? Who do you know wants to spend time with you every day? Every day. Well, some days I'm just grumpy. Yeah, me too. God's still looking for us. He still wants us to spend time with Him. He enjoys time with us. He, he has done everything possible so that you and I can, can be with Him forevermore. So He predestined us. He built us to, to relate to Him and that we can't be sufficient in and of ourselves. You and I are lost in and of ourselves. We lack something. I asked someone here recently, is there meaning in your life? Is there purpose in your life? No. What is the purpose of life? What's the meaning of life? It all is found in Jesus. In Him, everything comes together and makes sense. Does that mean everything's easy? No. We all know better than that. Okay. But everything makes sense in Him. The latter part here, uh, it says, and I, I will quit here in a minute. Um, it says in verse 11, Also we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to His purpose, who works all things after the counsel of His will, to the end that we who were the first to hope in Christ should be uh, to praise of His holy glory, should be to the praise of His glory. In Him, in Jesus, you also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also what? Believed. Believed. You were sealed in Him. After having believed. Is there a response required of us? Yes. We must believe in faith. Okay? You were sealed in Him with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is given as a pledge, or a down payment, is what it means, of our inheritance. In other words, the Holy Spirit comes to live with us, as a precursor of what it's going to be when we go to live with Him in heaven, unhindered from self. 
right now the Holy Spirit moves in and lives in us and we're still dealing with the brokenness of our sin and, and the, the, the power of sin, the presence of sin and all those things. We wrestle each day with sin. And, but it's just a down payment. We, we have the presence of God and the strength and, and, and He is leading us through this life. But one day we'll get the full, the full payment if you would, the, the, the full presence of God, unhindered from self and sin and all the things that we wrestle with, the struggles. Isn't that a good, a good thing? Okay. That's what the Holy Spirit is. And, that, and that's not, a, that's not a, a derogatory statement toward God. It's actually what the word means. Uh, the Holy Spirit is that down payment. And you'll find that again in Hebrews, uh, the wording that way, a shadow or Thing of things to come or a down payment when it comes to the Holy Spirit. Who is given as a pledge, that's the, the word for it or another translation of our inheritance. So, who initiates this relationship, us or God? Okay. Do we have to respond to that? Yes. Okay. What happens if we don't respond? But wait a minute, we're all built to go to heaven, right? That our Creator, we said that He manufactured us, He built us, He equipped us to have a relationship with Him forevermore, right? We're predestined to be that way. Is everybody going to be that way? No. It's our choice. It is our choice. I've never seen in Scripture where someone's free will was taken away. God doesn't want puppets. And when I say that, when I'm talking about free will taken away, I'm not talking about like a, a, a Samson or a Saul because God said, here I am, this is what's going to happen. Because <laughs> he's sovereign, he can do that. I'm talking about free will in that I, 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 I want to believe in God, but then I don't have the ability or the wherewithal to, to sin or to do this or to do that. Free will seems to be present throughout our lives. Hopefully we become, as the Holy Spirit works in our lives, and he sanctifies us. He cleanses us. He sets us apart. Hopefully we walk closer with God. And God is seen more clearly in us instead of us, the flesh. But the choice is there. The scripture says faith comes by hearing. And hearing by the word of God. That's right. Christians are heavenly minded. But they're in the world. But they're not of the world. That's right. There's a separation Dave said, Christians are in the world, but not of the world. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. That means if we're not in God's word, we're not hearing. We're not following, we're not growing. Faith comes, just like that waterfall right there. It, it comes. It cascades from heaven to us. Faith comes. God gives the faith that we need when we need it. You ever thought you'd face something and you just couldn't, it's too big to handle, too much brokenness to deal with? God pours out His grace and we have faith that we didn't even know we had because we didn't have it before. Faith comes from God. It's something He, he bestows on those as we yield to Him, trust Him, believe in Him. The question was posed by somebody in a conversation the other day about a family member who said, how can I believe, how can I make myself believe in God when I just don't believe? How can I, I can't force myself to believe. That's a legitimate question. Is there an answer to that? How do you have, how can you have faith in something that you presently don't have faith in? Have you lost faith in an institution or a group or a person in the past? How do you get that back? Yes. There were a lot of more intelligent people than me and probably any of us here. And they studied the Bible to disprove it, and they have ended up becoming Christians. That's right. That's a great point. People like Lee Strobel, um, I think C.S. Lewis, some of those who set out to disprove Scripture. And the more they dug, the deeper they dug, the more they saw that it was true. And that's how we got the movie Case for Christ. He was desperately trying to, to disprove the Bible. And the more he dug, the more he found it was true. And he became a man of faith. And is touring, I think, still today. Um, and, and 
that's true. We do research. We find out. We trust. Y'all each, I didn't see one person test these chairs when you came here to sit down. I didn't see anybody turn them upside down to read the label, to see who made them, who manufactured them. But we trust them because we sit in them every week. When we go out and get in our cars, we, we've done it so much. We trust that it's going to do what it's supposed to do. When we don't have faith in the Lord, there is a, an understanding that we, we walk with Him. Do some research. Test Him. And when I say that, I say it carefully. It's not attempting. But we sing songs about this. Try Him. It's ask Him to show Himself. You say, well, my faith is weak, Lord. I really don't, I don't get all this. Well, give Him an opportunity to show you. Do some research, do some study, do some digging, as, as Dave said, like Lee Strobel and some of the others, so that if our faith is weak or, or non-existent, non-existent, we figure it out. We, we read, we study, we, we pray, we say, God, I need, I need more faith. Do you know what usually happens when you pray for more faith? Same thing as when you pray for patience. Testing. Yes, testing. Testing. about at night in the sea which is not where you'd want to be it was still safer than getting out of the boat but I love the fact that in that story God did not calm the sea he had to get out and step in a stormy sea and it wasn't until he took the first step that he even needed the faith that God requires he had to test the waters and he had to get out of a boat that was floating at the time, perfectly fine, as far as we know, and step into the darkness, into a stormy sea. And if you remember the story, that sea remained stormy until they got back in the boat. When Peter got out of the boat, he was looking at the Lord, and he was walking toward him because he said, if you tell me to come, I'll come, and he did. But then, just like all of us, most of the time, there's some distractions around us in life, and he lost his focus. God didn't lose his power, did he? No. Jesus was still Jesus. Peter wasn't rebelling. He just got, all, he lost his focus. He started to sink. But he had the wherewithal to know where his help came from. And Jesus reached down to him, and he saved him. And they walk back to the boat together in the stormy sea. Being with Jesus doesn't mean the storm's going to calm down immediately. It just means he's in charge. He's in control. And we have to place our faith. But faith is not initiated until we take that first step. That it's needed. You don't need faith to stand right here on this concrete floor. If you're standing at the edge of a precipice and somebody says, lean back and trust me to hold you, you need faith then. And most of the time, God's going to say, let's take a walk to that cliff. I want to show you something. <laughs> so if we lack faith, pray, ask him. But understand what comes next is going to be something that's uncomfortable most of the time. God wants us to grow in our faith because he has predestined us, built us to trust him to have a relationship and fellowship with Him for all eternity. That's His main goal, is to grow us, to get us closer to Him, to trust Him, walk with Him. Paul is writing this letter that applies to all churches. It is in God. God initiated this relationship. It is God's strength. It is God's calling and equipping and, and election. It is God's predestining us, predestination that is going to that begins our life, that holds us in place, we must choose to follow Him, to yield to Him and place our faith in Him. It's all Him, but we must respond. Okay? We have to respond in faith. Okay? Any questions or comments? Yes, ma'am. Yes. 
I would stumble when they would, a non believer would come back at me with, with predestination. Mm -hmm. And I never really could explain to their satisfaction right. the difference. And now I can see it much clearer. I think I was confusing predestination with predetermination. And, but I love the, the Jeep analogy. That's the word here means decided ahead of time. He decided ahead of time for us to be his children, to be holy and blameless, is what the scripture says. He decided ahead of time. That's how he wanted this relationship to be. But there will be those that say, I don't want that. I'm going my own way. Um, I, my mind understands the Jeep illustration. That's why I use it. Anything else? All right. Um, we're going to continue. There's some other doctrinal things and some deep things in, in this letter. But uh, Paul addresses a lot of things that we as the church need to hear. And I believe the next week after Bible school, we will get into what the church is and how God established the church and, and what what importance that carries. Why? Why be a part of the church? Why is that important? So we'll talk about that. But let me pray with you and I'll let you go. Father, thank you for your word and your Holy Spirit. I thank you for leading us and guiding us and loving us to the point of showing your kindness to us as you've predetermined or pre predestined us to be your children, to have a relationship with you and fellowship with you and have an eternity to look forward to. Help us to respond appropriately. To respond to the Lord that created us, that's given us life, that has given us a future. Respond in faith as we ask for forgiveness, as we trust the work of Calvary, as Jesus has paid the ultimate price and mm -hmm. paid for our sins. And as we receive that as a covering for our iniquities and the payment for our sin, help us to walk by faith, not by sight be in this world but not of it, to be your children, to follow you, to trust in you, Lord, as you have built us and equipped us to do. In Jesus' name.